Well, welcome listeners to the next episode of the Live Better Connected podcast. Now, one of the things we've been talking about recently is the digital divide and what can industry and charities and government do about it. So I'm delighted today to be introducing to the podcast Helen Milner, OBE, who is the Chief Executive of the uh, Good Things Foundation. Now, the Good Things Foundation is here with its mission to fix the digital divide for good. So, Helen, lovely to have you on the show. Please do introduce yourself and explain to us what the Good Things Foundation does. Yeah, hi, Gareth. It's great to be here. Um, so Good Things Foundation, we're a national and international digital inclusion charity. So our whole mission is about fixing that digital divide. So helping people who um, either have never used the Internet or have used it a little bit um, and or can't afford the connectivity or the devices to be able to access. So it's both that motivation, skills and confidence, but also that affordability of devices. And we're all over the UK. So we have over 4,000 local partners. Um, so local community organisations, charities, libraries, even a fish and chip shop, you know, job centres, food banks, housing associations. You know, we've got all kinds of different people. I think of it as a big club with a shared vision. And it's all about helping that hyper local support in the community where digital excluded people are and we also do exactly the same thing in australia as well well from both ends of the, of the globe as such um and i mean people think of the digital divide as, as something fairly new but it's been going on for quite a while it's not it's not just a recent thing that we're all suddenly connected so how long has, have you been going as a sort of how, when was it set up so good things foundation is 12 so we're 12 years ago, um, we set up as an independent charity, but I've actually been doing this kind of work for longer than that. Um, in fact, uh, back in the early noughties at the turn of the century, I can say that there was only a third of people in the country actually had access to the internet, um, had, compu- had a connected computer in those days, it was all desktops. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, a computer cost a thousand pounds, you know, like the, an entry model. So it was much more expensive. Um, and there was a, a really small number of people who uh, didn't have it. And I think as time has gone on, the nature of digital exclusion has changed with things like the invention of the smartphone. Um, and so now really that the people who are digitally excluded are one, are they're even further behind. So as that digital divide has narrowed, um, they've been left further and further behind because services have digitised at the same time as more and more people have come online and got those skills. The other thing is the pandemic, of course, really highlighted it, and that maybe is what you're referring to, Gareth, is that when we had the lockdowns, it became apparent, I think, to everybody and to the media that there were you know, 25% of children in the lowest income households did not have access to a connected device and they're expected to do their schoolwork online. And that was very much a a running theme in the media. But of course, there were older people as well and people of all ages who couldn't access basic services, couldn't access, couldn't do online food shopping and therefore were much more exposed and vulnerable um, to um, having to go out um, during the during those lockdowns because they just couldn't um, access the internet. Well, I, I think the lockdown you, you, you know, was really a fascinating time because uh, I was instantly, and when we got the children home and they had to go on Google Classroom or Oak Academy or the others that, that were out there at the time, you know, we were very lucky because they had their own devices to use. But it was included when you know when me when we were sort of working in, in my capacity with Mobile UK, we had a lot of requests for connectivity and data, and and we found a lot of people even when we had provided that data, then didn't have something to use it on, or actually some of the skills didn't know how to use it. How was your experience of that? So up until the pandemic, um, so being twelve, obviously we were pretty well established, and we had all of those hyperlocal partners, but we were very focused around skills. So helping people with those very, very, very basic digital skills, you know, literally how to turn on a device or how to set up an email address, how to do a basic search, as well as obviously keeping themselves safe and some of those other things about using the Internet for health or jobs or whatever. Um, uh, So in January 2020, all of the doors of all of those local places shut. And at that moment, 
it became so apparent that the people who were digitally excluded, so the people who we had been helping with skills, were so reliant on those local places to get access. And so we then automatically started working with Future.now, with Nominate, with other partners, you know, Vodafone, Virgin Media Road 2, about how could we make sure that those people who couldn't go to a local place to get that support, they could actually get the access. And and that actually shifted our strategy to make sure that we provided people with access as well as those skills. Wow. And I, part of what you were saying struck me because this sort of has and have not, you know, as, as a divide, yeah, we are moving into a society where you can't do anything in many ways without uh, a connectivity, you know, even paying, you know, you pay via your mobile or a, or a card with a wireless payment system going on the train or the bus, you know, you have, we have these electronic gates and things that you use and even looking for jobs, you know, a lot of jobs are available are put online and, and having that ability to match yourself. You know, we talk about even dating, which is now all online as well, but it's almost dating in, in personal life, dating in jobs in terms of bringing right job to the right person. Um, but if you're not available to access that, you know, you're sort of outside of the world of, 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 of opportunity. It's really important to think about the skills as well as the access. So, um, if you don't have the access, then you definitely can't. 92% of all new jobs are only advertised online. So that means if you're not online, you're excluded from 92% of new jobs. Um, but also sometimes it's quite complicated. You Obviously, you have to have a CV. You might need to upload it. You might need to fill in an online form. Sometimes you have to do an online um, interview. Um, or you need to do some kind of online tests, like psychometric type tests. So um, actually, it's not just about you know, the classified ads online, actually, it's about, you know, finding it, but all of the, the complexion of, of applying for it. I think the other thing that happened because of the pandemic, and I think it's interesting now thinking back, you know, what that moment was, businesses and government also accelerated the pace of digitizing of their services. Um, so that, uh, you know, people were talking about digitizing services that they'd planned for the next three years in three weeks. So what we've got is we've got this um, divide that is massively being exposed and exacerbated where the, the, the haves and the have nots are people on the two sides of that digital divide. But you've also got all the services going online. GP appointments is one that we hear about so much that there are some GPs where it's really difficult to get an appointment if you're not online or even if you're not online, you might be able to get an appointment. But by the time you've got through on the phone, all the appointments have gone because all the online people have got the appointments. Um, paying bills is sometimes, you know, if you and I might think, well, how would we pay that bill if we weren't online? Ironically, now even a blue badge you have to apply online, right? So actually people who are older and disabled are least likely to be online and they need to do that for their blue badge. And something that people forget about is that actually by being online, you save money. There are lots of online only deals that you can access uh, because you're online. And the thing that people also say that they shop around a lot. So you can do the research online and see who's, where is it the cheapest? Um, so you, you actually pay less for goods because you're online. So there's so much that people are excluded from, both from the private sector, from like commercial offers, but also the public sector as well. And we talk about the digital divide, but you could also talk about like a twin track society. Well, just on that, I mean, some of the statistics that surround this, so in your own statistics, I think you said one in 20 households do not have access to the internet at home or 2 million UK households struggle to afford internet access. And and equally, I think some of the things that we've found in the mobile sector is, is the mobile dependency of people actually, uh, you know, homes, I think it's now um, uh, it's 11 million households actually only access the internet via their via the mo a mobile. Um, and in some things, in policy, I don't think necessarily mobile is as high up as, as it is. And you equally have people questioning whether what kind of connectivity they have and some of them will choose mobile over broadband or equally you've got people who are homeless who don't have broadband opportunities so in this space mobile is becoming more and more important um and i just wondered in, in terms of 
you know, one of the things you are known for as an agency is working with industry and not seeing that as a negative thing to do and actually positively doing that. And, and you've got a few initiatives that, that you are, are doing at the moment. I'd love to hear more about them. Yeah, so um, at Good Things Foundation, we have a strategy, as you said, to fix the digital divide for good. And we have some strategic partners who help us to do that. So Vodafone and Virgin Media O2 are two of our strategic partners alongside um, Nomina and more coming soon, I hope. Um, and we also have the National Data Bank. So the National Data Bank, if you think about it as a food bank, but for mobile connectivity, we have at least half a million SIMs to support people who can't afford connectivity. And they are um, shared with people across the country through what we call local data banks. So like literally like food banks. Um, so within the National Digital Inclusion Network, we have, as I said, thousands of local partners um, and some of them. So over 1500 of them are local data banks. So people can go and they can get access to um free sims for six to 12 months so they can get mobile connectivity they also have um calls and text on them as well if they're putting them into a phone but it's so important to see that that's six to 12 months because it's not just a one-off it's not just you can get free data for today it's actually data to put so you don't need to worry about it anymore you've got it you can afford it if you actually you want to also get a bit of help with um, with uh, with skills, how to use the internet, how to look for work, for example, um, that support is also there. So that it really is about um, for those people for whom affording the internet is something that they have never been able to do or they can't do it now um, uh, because of the cost of living crisis. You know the number of people who need it has gone up. Then they can go and get it. So that's an absolutely amazing initiative. And the data in the data bank is from O2, Vodafone, and three. Three and uh, and just how do do people access that data? I mean, how does that work on on a on a on a on a, on a day to day level? You know, if I if I had an issue, how do I go to the Good Things Foundation? How do I access that data? Um, how does that work? Um, so the irony is that you can find it on a map. I mean, most people get signposted or also the reason why we have thousands of local partners are because they're already working with people. So, as I said, their local community centres, their food banks, their job centres, their housing associations, their small local charities working with people who are homeless or unemployed or older people. So they're already working with people who may need the data bank. So uh, that's on one level that that being in the community, those community organisations are reaching the people who need it. Um, we do have a map on our website on goodthingsfoundation.org forward slash map so people can go and find a local place. Or if you're like a Citizens Advice Bureau, you could then signpost people to your local um, your local places. Um, the um, O2 stores and Virgin Money stores are both also data banks. So people who are going into those stores can get support from, from them. So um, even as simple as going onto a high street shop. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, and the great news is, is that both with O2 and with um, Virgin Money, they started small. They did a pilot and it really worked for them. And so all of their stores are now um, either already or becoming data banks. Um, so, yes, yeah, so in the high street, you can do it. And, and I think the, the idea is, is when when you are there and you're saying, I really need this, but I can't afford it or. I'm I need a loan because I I'm I'm in debt or I've got financial issues or I need to take a break on my on my mortgage or on my loan they can actually say oh you know are you struggling to pay for other bills like broadband and you can have a free sim to help you so um that so then on a practical level you get the sim you put it into your phone or into another device um that we've given out um, over 10,000 devices as well. We have the National Device Bank where businesses um, and public sector councils have given us uh, uh, thousands of laptops, tablets and phones. Um, so we can give those out. And we've also given out more than a thousand MiFi's and dongles to go with those. Um, so our ideal is if you can't afford anything that you can get a device that can connect to the internet with a free SIM and all of that is free for people so they don't need to worry. 
it sounds an amazing initiative. And, and certainly you also mentioned earlier uh, skills as well. And I have to mention also that uh, one of our other members, EEBT, you've worked for them with the BT Skills for Tomorrow, which offered face-to-face digital training to get people, as you say, these devices. Not everyone knows exactly how to use them. Um, which, you know, is, is quite a disabilitating, I think, especially if you, you haven't come across new software or, or a different operating system or even, you know, simply just having how to connect it up to, to Wi-Fi or, or a mobile signal. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And the other thing that BT did that um, isn't a priority for good things, but they also um, work with small businesses. So those very small business, nano businesses, um, because often for them, the difference between surviving thriving or not being around anymore is actually how they use those digital services and quite often people will set up being a sole trader um and mm. have they don't have the digital skills that they need and i don't mean about um you know doing fancy things i mean actually emailing a quote to, to a customer or doing online banking so you can get paid quickly you know like some of those really really basic fundamental things and i know bt um, and others have, have helped small businesses as well with those basic digital skills. or even accepting mobile payments you know i think what was astounded me during the pandemic was how many sort of companies were still only accepting cash and you would, you know, I, I personally, I, I, I use my phone and, and I felt that I didn't have any money on me. So I'd, I'd have to go to another shop that did accept it. So that, that was a loss of a sale. And you know, just having that ability or, or trust and confidence to move into the digital world was always a really interesting thing that these companies uh, and small businesses particularly just needed that little bit of a, a sort of push to get there. Yeah. Um, I think, Gareth, just one thing that I think that um, is really important is the scale of this, right? Is that... I think before the pandemic, there would be people um, who, you know, have a job where you're using the internet every day, your friends all are online, that actually, it. I think a lot of people thought it was a very minority issue, and it was an issue that only affected a few older people. But actually, I think it's so important, like 10 million people don't have the basic digital skills they need for life. Um and 39% of the, are in the working age population. Um, that actually, that you know, we know that children were affected um, who couldn't do online schooling. Um, and we know that, as you said, that one in 20 households, you know, are struggling with, a, a 2 million households struggling with affording the internet, that these are big numbers. These are very, very big numbers. And so I think it's important that, digital exclusion isn't seen as like something that is, is like a minority subject that there's a, just a few people left that we need to cross the digital divide these are big numbers of people who are significantly left behind and significantly disadvantaged in our society. and equally a, a section of society that doesn't necessarily have the voice that others do and i think one of the things from a mobile perspective and one of the things i'm focused on is, is deploying that infrastructure to provide that connectivity is often we find that those that don't necessarily like the look or feel of something have a larger voice of someone who's actually, you know, needs that connectivity to get that, you know, for employment purposes, to keep in touch with people, to access to, you know, cheaper products online or whatever. But, you know, they don't necessarily have the ability to, to sort of uh, put forward that they need this. And it's those that often object. And I think what yeah. we found, this brings us actually interesting onto our Live Better Connected Challenge, which we because what we wanted to do is understand what people's understanding of their connectivity was. You know, we've just had a really wonderful discussion about how connectivity is so important. But what this survey found was that people don't actually understand how connected they already are. And therefore, there may be that disconnect between why they need this infrastructure there and that capacity and that connectivity as to how they're using it. Just as some of the stats, Helen, I'd love to get some of your thoughts on this. But we found 40% of people responding to our survey said they only had one to four devices. Yet the vast majority had far over 10 devices and uh, equally 80% said they had one to nine. But some of those grounding down into it, you know, we, we found, especially for this topic, you know, uh, those who are 70 plus, the more elderly, uh, equally 64% of those thought they had only one to four devices. But the average was actually nine devices, so nearly sort of double what they thought they were. And again, we found on wealth, you know, those that are, are less wealthy, were less connected than those that were more wealthy. So for instance, if you had an income of 75,000 and above, you were roughly around 15 devices, but up to 10,000, only nine devices. So again, more connected than, than you thought, but clearly a disparate, a, you know, a, a difference between those who have the, the, the access and those who don't. 
Um, and then finally, just as another sort of statistic, it was those uh, we found that if you were le- not employed or, or, or retired, again, you know, you're less likely to be as connected to someone who is employed and has access to it. So some really fascinating, I think, sort of fit in with what you were saying. So just interested in some of your thoughts and what that might mean. Yeah, definitely. And so I think that for me, those stats aren't surprising. So if you're on lower income, if you're unemployed, if you're older, you're much more likely to be digitally excluded. So um, them having fewer connected devices rings true. Um But I think that disparity between what people think they have and what they actually have, I think, is fascinating. And is is that about the the technology is all pervasive, right, that they're not thinking about their smart speaker, you know, their Alexa or their Google Assistant. They're not thinking about their smart um, light bulbs or their smart doorbells. They're just thinking about, you know, the phone, the laptop, the tablet, that they're not actually thinking more widely about how they've kind of embedded digitally connected yeah. devices. And, and do you think lives? not knowing, not not necessarily thinking that, you know, i.e., like you say, I, I'm going on the tube or I, I'm going on the bus or I'm accessing my, in, you know, the bank via the internet, not thinking that is being connected. Does that have an impact on, on people then not understanding the digital divide because they're not necessarily thinking this is connectivity. They just think that is day-to-day, you know, what we do. I think it definitely affects decision makers. So I think that's partly why the, you know, the pandemic lockdowns became such a surprise how many people were excluded to so many people because the decision makers are typically in your higher income groups. They've definitely got a job, you know, they're definitely of working age. So that they're in that demographic where they're not digitally excluded and maybe the only people that they come across who aren't using devices, are, you know, their grand, their grandparents or their great grandparents. Um, so I, I think that uh, those of us who are in this sort of all pervasive world where we're embracing and we love the benefits that technology is bringing to us, I think it's really hard to empathize and to imagine that there are whole communities who are excluded, um, where there are lots of people who are excluded. And so, you know, we know from, you know, prejudice and bias around, you know, AI data sets and uh, people who are designing online services that actually they're not thinking about the wider society when they're doing that. And so that, that actually their voices aren't being heard at all. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's really fascinating. And some, and some of the additional statistics on actual what devices people use are really telling as well. We f- sort of asked people, the, obviously the biggest device that people were putting down was the mobile phone around 81%. But then we sort of asked, well, what about things like e-tickets, you know, things like uh, the Oyster or, um, or travel passes? And then 43% of people were using those. So you're seeing the majority of people aren't exploiting that according to their survey. And then what about smartwatches? We saw 28% of people of using sort of smartwatches. If we turn that as a wearable, these are fitness metrics, you know, being able to control your life and, and how well and healthy you are. Again, a big part of the you know population here, as a, suggesting from this survey, don't have access or aren't using that stuff or are unaware of it, going back to, again, trust or confidence or, or understanding of how to use it. Yet these things, especially, you know, I have one here for, for my blood pressure because I, I you know to keep, keep my understanding, keep my doctor abreast of where my blood pressure is and the medication. Um, but again, that's something I have access to. Not everyone does. Um, and then finally, if we look down to sort of, again, EGH, you know, things like going through, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, your, your passport control and all of that and, and having the ability to have that biometrics, you know, the, the people, some people just use it because they, it's there. Others don't know about it. I think that's right. I, I think, though, that, you know, it's pretty impossible to go on holiday in an airport and not use an e-gate, right? Um, I think, though, that, you know, we also have gadgets, right? So, you know, your Fitbit or your smartwatch or something you thought was a good idea, but now it's in a drawer somewhere. Um, you know, my Kindle would have dust on it. Um, so, you know, there are there are the things that come in and out of fashion. I think we also hang on to devices as well. So, you know, that's why we invented the National Device Bank because we want to make sure that we can get all of those devices. We're focused on businesses because we want them 
um, you know, we have actually had devices donated to us that have been put in the in the basement, you know, like whole basements full of laptops and things, cupboards full of smartphones, um, and get, they're, they're then donated to us. We refurbish them and clean them and we get them into the hands of digital excluded people um, because we just kind of let this stuff lie around sometimes, right? So <laughs> I think there's that... Take some of us take it for granted that we have access to all of these things to such an extent that we can buy it for Christmas or get it as a present and then put it on the shelf and never use it or have a fit of using it for six months and then forget about it. Whereas there are people in our society who have nothing, who don't have don't have a phone at all, right? Or just have a really, really basic phone because they have to have some way of getting uh, phone calls. Um, and I think it's really important that as a society that we say that we don't want to have that level of digital inequality, you know, and we want to make sure that people understand what they're doing, you know, that they understand that, that there is a digital society that they're part of. Um, so I think it's so important that we all work together in partnership to make sure that we fix that digital divide. And I believe we can fix it, right? So that, you know, there are some challenges in our society that are incredibly difficult, but I think this is one that we can actually fix. Well, Helen, I think that is a perfect way to, to finish off the, the podcast. I think, you know, working in partnership is exceptionally important. I think you as, a, as, a, as an organisation showcase how you can do that with charities, with industries, with governments. And I think, you know, we as Mobile UK and, the, and our members, you know, certainly are very much taking part in that. Um, so very huge thank you uh, to, to meeting with me today and talking about the Good Things Foundation and all the great work that you do. Um, for everyone else, I thank you again, listeners. Uh, you know, really had some wonderful time and some of the uh, episodes we've been doing. We're looking forward to do much more. Um, please do, uh, again, subscribe to the channel, um, subscribe to the, the podcast and share uh, as you will. Um, and once again, thank you all. Um, look forward to seeing you next time.